Hello, everyone, and thanks for hanging out with us for the Behind the Numbers weekly listen and e-marketer podcast made possible by Mountain. This is the Friday show that reviews the most stop traffic media news stories of the week. I'm your host, Marcus Johnson. In today's show, can Trump's truth social platform make some noise? Political viewpoints and discussions and having a bunch of people on there, it seems really hard when it's coming from a very hyper-political person. And that is, I think, why none of these sort of politically affiliated social apps have really ever taken off. Rebranding the newsfeed. Could it potentially help on the revenue side, maybe? Maybe it makes brands feel like there's a little bit more brand safety now that it's not news feed, it's just the feed. So there's more delineation between like the types of posts. Is LinkedIn the best social network? When all of these other social networks are all trying to imitate each other, LinkedIn is kind of like a master class of learning to just stay in your lane and just build up the brand that works right for you. And they are doing a great job at that. Uber and Lyft rebound, an unpopular opinion about Disney, and where did Valentine's Day come from exactly? Join me for this episode. We have three people. Let's meet them for crying out loud. We start with senior analyst on our retail and e-commerce team. It's Blake Drosh. Hey, everybody. Hey, fella. We're also joined by one of our directors of forecasting, Oscar Orozco. Hey, Marcus. Thanks for having me. Hey, fella. And finally, we have one of our senior forecasting analysts. It's Peter Varley. Hey, Marcus. Hey, fella. That's the squad. Let's talk about what's in store for you guys today. Four quarters as per usual. We start with the story of the week. We're going to be talking about Truth Social, the new social network from Mr. Trump, whether that can make a splash. We then move to the game of the week where our contestants, Blake, Oscar and Peter, will go head to head to head to give us the best takeaways they possibly can to try and win a championship belt. We then move to uncommon knowledge where we talk about some unpopular opinions. Finally, dinner party data where we talk about random trivia, uh, things we just recently learned. We start with the story of the week. Can Trump's truth social platform make some noise? Banned from Twitter, Trump returns with a new platform, writes James Clayton and Sam Cabral of the BBC. Donald Trump's social media platform Truth Social launched on President's Day in a limited form on the US Apple App Store with similarities to Twitter, commentators note. Twitter bans the former president following last year's January 6th US Capitol riot, saying he had broken its rules on the glorification of violence. On Truth Social, posts are referred to as truths shown to users on a truth feed. Folks can also retruth a post. Reuters reports that Truth Social is working on a direct messaging feature, notifications about new content, and a user verification policy. Truth Social describes itself as a big tent social media platform that encourages an open, free, and honest global conversation without discriminating against political ideology, and is also a censorship-free experience. Truth Social has been open to invited guests only as early as December, with around 500 beta testers later gaining access to the network. Some early users had difficulties registering accounts when the app went up on President's Day. Others were prompted to join a waitlist. Project lead and former Congressman Devin Nunes said it was expected to be fully operational by the end of March. All right, folks, initial reactions to this new social network from, from Mr. Trump. Is it worth talking about? Can it make any noise uh, amongst the giants? Yeah, I think it's definitely, you know, warrants a discussion considering how strong the Trump brand remains uh, post-presidency and the fact that there's clearly an appetite among uh, political class for alternative social networks. But I think the question remains, you know, It's obviously very, very logistically difficult to operate a social network, and many of the alternatives have stumbled coming out of the gate. So I think we're going to have to talk about two different things. Branding being one, which I think there certainly has some potential from that standpoint, but the ability to operate a fully fledged, uh, to scale a fully fledged social network is very very difficult. And that has nothing to do with how strong the Trump brand might be. Yeah, talking about the Trump brand, I mean, previous is a big previous following. One reason that it would work across the platforms Mr. Trump has amassed 
had amassed 150 million, 150 million followers. Uh, that's half of all the people in America. 88 million on Twitter, 35 million on Facebook, placing him as one of the most popular figures on social media notes to Wall Street Journal. So can you can you bring some of those folks over perhaps? But Blake, to your other point, one reason it likely won't work, others have tried. Uh, there are other alternative platforms presenting themselves as censorship free. Getter, Parler or Parlay, Gab, Rumble, um, and they haven't really attracted noteworthy audience sizes. Yeah, a main sort of branding, main branding for the platform is well, it's two words really. It's it's or two phrases. It's free speech and, and the censorship part, right? And censorship, uh, although they are talking about not you know having to you know how that's more of uh, an issue with the platforms that we're all familiar with now. Censorship is going to be something that they'll have to deal with. It'll be interesting to see how that works. Correct yeah. when we see things like you know, hate speech or potentially race, racist ideology or things that, you know, we see on all platforms now. So th- that'll be interesting, right? Because, you know, it could lead toward, you know, the same issues we're seeing now with Twitter and Facebook with this portion of the population that's that's more conservative in nature. Uh, but yeah. also when we think of, of operating systems, right, these are still platforms that have to operate within the devices that we're all familiar with, whether it's, uh, it's Apple or Google devices. And so if there are any rules that are broken there, you know, the platform could have issues with, you know, app stores on on any of these two operating systems. So how is that going to work? That's really the the main thing I thought of. Yeah, because we've got an example of that, right? Last year, Apple and Google removed Parler from their stores or Parler from their stores for failing to take down posts they said threatened violence and contained illegal activity. So it can't be a completely censorship free experience because to to your point, Oscar, they are the gatekeepers, Google and Apple to to a large extent. Peter, what do you think? Can this work? I think this might be one of the best campaign PR and branding moves sort of ever if a lot of people hop on and they're really there for, you know, to hear Trump and Trump supporters and people who follow that sort of ideology, then, you know, this is could be a valuable piece of technology to disseminate ideas. But as far as becoming a full fledged social app with a large enough following to sort of run the gamut of political viewpoints and discussions and having a bunch of people on there, it it seems really hard when it's coming from a very hyper political person. And that is, I think, why none of these sort of politically affiliated social apps have really ever taken off. Because people go on Twitter, on Facebook, and some of these other ones largely for debate and to hear other opinions that are different than their own. And that's what makes it an exciting place to be and where you find new information and you maybe get mad at something. And that's, you know, how we know their algorithm is designed to really churn out new content. So we've just never seen an example of something on one side of the spectrum gain a large enough audience to be an effective business. Yeah. Yeah. The the audience is going to be fascinating because you could argue that Mr. Trump should have a more engaged audience. Republicans, a recent Axios article noted folks across the political spectrum all reported a decline in interest in the national news over the past year, Democrats' interest declined the most. So they had 34% of them were paying a great deal of attention to the national news last year, 2021. That's down from 69% the year before. So 69%, it dropped to 34 uh, that's compared to 40% of Republicans. So more Republicans paying attention to the national news as come from the Gallup and the Knight Foundation. Harris poll found over 60% of Republicans were concerned social media was censoring politicians versus 20% of Democrats. 60 for Republicans, 20 for Democrats. So if you're marketing yourself as a censorship-free experience, maybe you're going to appeal to that audience. That said, when folks were asked what the number one source of misinformation about recent news topics was, this is in October 2020, 58%, the most of anyone uh, or anything, was Donald Trump. 58% of people said Donald Trump was the greatest source of misinformation ahead of social media, uh, ahead of Republican leaders, ahead of even cable news. It was also from the Gallup and the Knight Foundation. It's going to be interesting to see what, what they can get the numbers up to. There's some early indication that the numbers looked pretty good. There's a few hours after launching, they appeared to have over 100,000 folks on the wait list already. That's not including the folks who had joined the app's pre-launch wait list. Uh, and Truth Social was listed in the top charts for downloads on the App Store on Monday morning, ahead of HBO Max and even TikTok as well. Can they get anywhere close to any of the major social apps, folks? Any, anyone think that they can actually get close to, I don't know, a Twitter, a Snapchat. I mean, obviously not tomorrow, but does it have the potential? I think it's really unlikely if we're just going to base it off of 
the performance that we've seen from some of the other alternative competitors. I know you mentioned- Even with Trump behind him? Behind, you know, behind I, the service? It, it's, it, I don't think so. I think that relying on one voice, no matter how popular that voice that it might be to propel a, an entire social network- no, I don't. I don't think. I don't think that's likely. That's like kind of like when you bring, you know, like a superstar onto a basketball team that isn't very good. It's like, yeah, they can might be able to to win a few games, but it's hard to win championships mm. with, uh, you know, mm. just one great player. Good analogy. Yeah. Yeah, and and aside from you know, I guess the I guess a political discourse or a place for it that is uh, more you know comfortable for a, a section of the population here in the U.S. And that was one thing I was going to mention. Another thing potentially holding it back is I don't see much of a of a potential for any geographic expansion. It seems like very U.S. specific, and we know with many of the of tech companies now, you know, much of that growth eventually comes from international expansion. But you yeah. know, aside from that, it seems to be a lot like what Twitter is. I'm not seeing any differentiating features there. So for yeah. now, that's holding it back as well. Yeah. What will the content look like as well? Uh, we'll see. That's all we've got time for for the story of the week. It's time now for the game of the week. First quick word from our sponsor, Mountain. Mountain is turning connected TV into performance TV. Their marketing software solution gives advertisers everything they need to quickly and easily launch connected TV campaigns that are fully optimized to achieve specific marketing goals. From conversions and revenue to website visits and more, Mountain Performance TV is tailor-made to treat television as a performance ad channel, just like paid search and social. Visit mountain.com to learn more and discover the impact it can have for your brand. Folks, we're back, of course. It's time now for the game of the week. Today's game, what is the bloody point? Where I read out four stories and have contestants, Peter, Oscar, and Blake, tell us what they think is the main takeaway of the story. Okay answers get one point, good answers get two, and answers that give you the same feeling as the exact moment you beat the level of a video game you were stuck on forever. Answers that leave you with that feeling, they get you three points. Each person gets 20 seconds to answer before they hear this. Whoever has the most points wins, gets the last word. Let's play. We start with Peter. Rebranding the newsfeed. Facebook rebrands its newsfeed after over 15 years. The newsfeed is now just the feed, writes Mitchell Clark of The Verge. Facebook said the change does not impact the app experience more broadly. Peter, rebranding the newsfeed, what's the point? You know, I, this is exactly what Facebook and Meta needed to shoot their stock all the way back up to where it was before and well beyond. <laughs> they are just going to blow all estimates out of the water for Q1 2022. <laughs> this is nothing. <laughs> Oscar. I mean, I mean, I agree. I agree. I mean, aside from it sounding you know, more sleek and, and potentially modern, I mean, just to you know, think about it a little bit more critically. I mean, could it potentially help on the revenue side? Maybe, maybe it maybe makes brands feel like there's a little bit more brand safety now that it's not news feed, it's just the feed. So there's more mm-hmm. delineation between like the types of posts, whether they're actual news posts or, you know, um, wedding photos or, you know, t- talking about something more politically uh, specific. I don't know. That's the only thing I can think about, but I, I agree with you, Peter. <laughs> like, yeah, this is just another meaningless brand change for Facebook to try and spin some sort of PR angle. But I think it's weird that they're even touching something like the newsfeed. It feels so inconsequential compared to all of these other, you know, arguably existential issues that they're dealing with right now. Second round, we start with Oscar. How Apple changed Facebook. A recent Wall Street Journal piece notes that Facebook was long one of the surest bets in digital advertising. No longer. It points to small business owner Martha Kruger, who runs a gift basket business called Gifton Market. She used to spend her whole ad budget on Facebook and Instagram getting a new customer for every $14 she spent. But when Apple's privacy feature that restricts user tracking came into effect last year, her costs to acquire such customers rose tenfold. In October, she moved her whole ad budget to search ads on Google. 
The piece notes that Meta expects a roughly $10 billion hit to sales this year as the result of the Apple change, which requires apps to ask users for permission to track their activity and share it. Oscar, how Apple changed Facebook. What's the point? Yeah, it's a really interesting topic. I think Facebook's going to be really lucky. It's recent reports seem to indicate that privacy sandbox on Android won't be as bad as the IDFA changes we're seeing there with Apple. So, you know, we'll see how that plays out, but it seems like they might have dodged the bullet there. But it's really interesting. I mean, we're, we're going to see more advertisers taking consumer data collection to their own hands. But I, I also think on the platform side, recently LinkedIn, you know, and we're seeing this from platforms are trying new things. They rolled out this new group identity for B2B targeting option. So it categorizes users into segments. Uh, It allows advertisers to reach intended audiences that that way. So less targeted. But I I think we're going to see more of this, more big ideas, bigger thinking. There'll be a way to get almost to where things were. Not quite, but it'll be interesting to see how the tech uh, industry grows. Blake. Yeah, you know, I think the point now to the point of discussion right now is is really how long is Facebook going to be able to take to sort of reinvigorate its analytics and its targeting while it still has the massive, massive amount of eyeballs that it has on its platform? Because long term, even though things are looking really bad right now, they can afford to take a couple of years and rebuild that business back up given by you know just be based on the fact that they have still this the largest amount of users over any other social network and as long as they have those users and they can figure out a way to monetize them then i think they actually will be able to find a way to bounce back maybe not a hundred percent but still in a way that it'll it could be very very lucrative of an advertising business for them peter yeah, I agree that, you know, they could still have an ad business that makes a lot of money regardless of any other factors over the next couple of years because of their scale. But this is a, a really huge headwind on that's going to cost them $10 billion this year, they said. And then Google recently has announced that they will be introducing similar privacy features over the next couple of years. So that will mean there's going to be even more problems on the Android side of things, you know, in addition to iOS. So this is a really big long term problem for Facebook and Meta. And I don't think it's a coincidence that they're now talking about VR and the metaverse as their ad business sort of faces these struggles. Bonus data app analytics company Flurry says only 18% of US users chose to opt in to tracking across all apps. One in five. We move to our third round. We start with Blake. Is LinkedIn the best social network? Let's face it, LinkedIn might be the best social network right now, writes Joanna Stone of the Wall Street Journal. She notes that unlike in her Facebook, Twitter and Instagram feeds, the conversation is meaningful and people are civil, and there's no politics, at least not anymore with the recent introduction of a no politics button on LinkedIn. Other new features include the ability to just follow people instead of a more commitment-heavy connect request by turning on a creator mode within LinkedIn. You can also add a 30-second video cover story to your profile. The company's revenues uh, were up nearly 40% year-on-year in Q4, and new hires made through the service more than doubled. Blake, LinkedIn being the best social network, what's the point? I don't think it's the best social network. I mean, it's the aesthetic of LinkedIn is still pretty stuffy and self-promotional, but it is a sort of what all of these other social networks like are all trying to imitate each other. LinkedIn is kind of like a masterclass of learning to just stay in your lane and just build up the brand that works right for you. And they are doing a great job at that. I mean, there is no professional network competitor to LinkedIn, whereas all of these other social networks are trying to eat each other alive. Uh, LinkedIn is sort of just staying in its lane and is, is thriving because they're not trying to be something they're not. So I do agree with it from that aspect. Yeah. Peter. Yeah, LinkedIn has such a promising future because when I, um, I go on there and I see, you know, what people are currently talking about and the features on the site, and then I hear about the new things they're planning to add, I just think about how they're still just scratching the surface as business professionals are still trying to figure out what the future of work will be. And everyone can agree it's going to be digital. It's going to be online more so than ever before. And it's still being defined. And LinkedIn is, as the market leader, gets to define how that looks in the future. And that's a really, really good place for them to be. Oscar. 
Yeah, although the piece read a, a bit too much like a big advertisement, I'm on board. I'm a big LinkedIn fan. I, I think, you know, yes, the pandemic has driven a lot of engagement on the platform and it's still there. We're seeing the great resignation, a, job, a hot job market. Uh, but there's so many other use cases, like uh, my colleagues just mentioned, the connecting with coworkers and, and even events and webinars and, and LinkedIn learning and, and all of that. There's so much to do on it that it really does have this unique unique place in the social ecosystem. So um, I really do believe in it and I'm excited to see what they could do more with, with video and audio and other types of content. So um, I believe there's, there's more to LinkedIn that we'll see uh, into the next year and the coming years. Yeah, bonus take. Well, I think there's just accountability on LinkedIn that there just isn't on other platforms because if you post something ridiculous, hurtful, harmful, then your colleagues see it and it can affect your career. So for some reason, LinkedIn just has, it just has accountability that the others just don't seem to be able to hold on to. Final round, Uber and Lyft rebound. We start with Peter. Uber and Lyft revenue climbed over 80% last Q4, helped by a recovery in its rides business and continued demand for food delivery, despite restaurant reopenings, writes Pritika Rana of the Wall Street Journal. 2021 full-year revenue rose nearly 60%, they ended the quarter with uh, about 120 million active customers, a record for the company. Uber's gross bookings forecast for Q1 is slightly below analysts' estimates, though. Lyft, however, Q4 revenue was up 70% year on year, posting a record revenue per active rider. Lyft reported 18.7 million active riders in Q4. That is down slightly, ever so slightly, from the 18.9 in Q3. Higher, though, than the 13 million Q4 of the year before that, 2020, but still down from a 23 million active riders of uh, pre-pandemic 2019. Uh, Uber and Lyft rebounding, Peter, what's the point? There were definitely promising signs in their Q4 earnings reports, but I, I do think that the strong year-over-year -year growth comparisons don't really mean too much, honestly, just given how much the travel sector was just, you know, down in the dumps in 2020. So, you know, Performing well against that is what exactly should be happening for any half decent business. I do think that there's a bit of a catch 22 with the driver shortages because Uber and Lyft want drivers to come back. In order to do that, they need to pay them more. And if you pay them more, then you have to increase prices for consumers. So that's an interesting sort of dilemma that they're going to have to face. And we'll see how it shakes out probably this year. Oscar. Yeah, I mean, also the, the guidance that was provided for Q2 this year shows that some of the expectations from, you know, sure, some strong growth, like Peter just mentioned, will be down a bit in 2022, some issues from Omicron. I thought also there was there was some great take there from an analyst that covers the two companies at True Securities. The analyst wrote pretty much that pricing, uh, the reason that some of this growth was due to pricing. So we're still seeing that these apps, the prices are, are extremely high. Also, it appears that, you know, just as Peter mentioned, drivers are in short supply. We're also seeing that these so-called surge rides, they were making up 50% of all trips in New York. Now they're down to 20, but that's that's still very high. So with gas prices being high, I mean, there, there's a lot of issues here still for me to really consider these companies to be in a bullish state. Like. Yeah, I completely agree with Oscar. However, I, I will say that the demand for ride share is never going to go away. I think it's only it's a model that is just only going to become more and more in demand and not just in urban areas but suburban areas as well. And I think that Uber and Lyft are really afforded the ability to sort of figure out very very slowly how these business models are going to work because of the fact that the model of the ride share or whatever you want to call it, just an expansive network of, of taxis or ride shares in a format that is, you know, digital forward, uh, ordering through your phone. That's never going to go away. And I think that it's basically going to be something that is going to afford Uber and Lyft the time to figure this out. But I agree with everything on a company level that Peter and Oscar said. I think there's still a lot to be resolved and a lot to be figured out to make these two particular businesses actually you know, profitable and stable companies. So yeah, I'm curious to know when shared rides are going to come back. 
and this may sound like a ridiculous idea, but it, you know, it, it seemed ridiculous until they started doing it. But before, with and what I'm talking about is that you know they have the perspex glass between the driver and the passenger. Maybe there's a world where they put perspex between the two, like in the middle of the car, in the middle of the back seat, so you can have one rider on the left, one rider on the right. Maybe that encourages people to to get in shared rides because that could bring the price down for consumers, but also allow drivers to get paid a decent wage. So I'm curious to know if that's going to come back anytime soon. That is all we've got time for for the game of the week. This week's winner, drum roll it. Blake is this week's winner of the game of the week. Congratulations to Blake. He wins the game of the week, gets the championship belt and the last word. Blake, what you got for us? Um, I just want to, I want to send a message to Major League Baseball. Send a message? Yeah. Sounds a, sounds a bit mob related. What do you mean you're going to send a message? <laughs> it's it's not, not a place for that. Let's end this lockout. That's all I want to say. Let us have a baseball season this year, please. The Mets, the the Mets are looking too good to not have. Are they? <laughs> we'll see about that. Get rid of those robot umps. And no robot umps. Yeah. We're making good points here, gents. Let's on that, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll allow a robot ump or two if you start the season on time. <laughs> yeah. That is what we've got time for for the game of the week. Congratulations to Blake. He wins the championship belt. It's time now for Uncommon Knowledge. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge, the segment where we offer up some unpopular or atypical opinions about things. We start with an unpopular opinion from the BBC Radio 1 feature. This segment was inspired by and then an unpopular opinion from the internet. And then finally, we get an unpopular opinion from one of our analysts related to the media world. So gents, listeners, I've got an unpopular opinion for you uh, from the BBC Radio Show. No one over the age of 10 should enjoy magic shows. Can't say I've seen one to have enjoyed it or not once I've passed the age of 10. Seen any magic shows recently, fellas? I, I disagree with that. Yeah, I'm, I'm forgetting oh. the name of it on, on Netflix, uh, but I'm a big magic fan. And it's, it doesn't just have to be, you know, rabbit out of a hat type. I mean, there's really <laughs> cool things that they do. Um, and I'm, I'm going to try to find out the name of that show, but totally disagree. Magic is, is so cool. So cool. Magic's for everyone. Says yeah, Oscar. it's for everyone. Shout out co-founder Jeff Ramsey. Who yes, gave good point. Really great yeah. magic shows at all of our company holiday parties, and I feel like even more often than that, you know, I feel I feel yeah, like I would yeah. always be seeing magic tricks here and there, and those were always fun. Everyone loved them, and nobody at the company was what under ten years old. So <laughs> I think that we can That's officially true. say that we have debunked that myth. Yeah, eMarketer co-founder Jeff Ramsey. Yeah, good shout, Peter. And and the show is Magic for Humans with uh, the magicians Justin Willman. A lot of fun. Watch it, people. Okay, great, great show. Okay, doesn't say Magic for Kids. It's Magic for Humans. That includes yeah. everyone. <laughs> all right, folks. Uh, another one for you. This one's from the internet that I found. All types of music are great, but country has to go. What do we think? I used to think that. I don't mind a little country now. It's been kind of drilled into my head to appreciate it. Thanks, America. But um, yeah, most of it can probably still go, let's be honest. Most of it can go. But I have had an yeah. about face about it. I, I do enjoy some good country music. When I, when a I, couple of good yeah, ones in When there. I heard some George Strait hits, I was converted. That was it? That was that's the, that's right. what it took. Yeah, tipping point. I think it's like, like popular country music. Like country pop is almost yes. like its own genre. And then there's like the more like traditional like outlaw country, southern rock that's kind of like blended together. That can be really, really good. I think it's just yeah. the bad country sort of makes a lot more noise than than the good country. So that's where that stigma comes from. Where does Chris Stapleton, where's he, where's he live? Is he, is he, is country, is country, no? Does that count? Was it more rock? He's country so. rock. Yeah, he's probably okay. right there at the intersection, I'd say. Tennessee whiskey, so good. So yeah, if he's country, fine. The problem is the country pop, what, what, what Blake just said. But I think, yeah, uh, the natural evolution of rock and roll as we used to know into mm-hmm. a lot of different, you know, subcategories of country, um, that's kind of what it's become. So, yeah, a, a lot of country is good, but, yeah, that pop country, not for me. All right, country, you can stay. All right, we've got one more unpopular opinion. This comes from Blake, and it's about the media world. Blake, what you got for us? Yeah, so we were, we were talking before the podcast about this new... Uh, concept that Disney unveiled last week called Story Living by Disney it kind of made the rounds in a lot of the tech media. This article from The Verge by James Vincent uh, sums it up pretty well. Uh, headline is Disney is developing planned communities for fans 
who never want to leave its clutches. Disney has launched a new business for fans who can't bear to leave the pristine, family-friendly world the corporation has nurtured through its theme parks and media ventures. Story Living by Disney will operate as part of the company's theme parks division, developing a series of master-planned communities for residential living designed by Disney's creative staff and offering the same pampered tranquility found in its resorts. So I don't know if you guys find this notion of living at Disney World as disturbing as I do, but I think it's perhaps a, a really significant indicator that we're on the verge of a societal collapse. Uh, it, it's it's probably quite imminent if people decide ultimately that they want to throw reality down the drain and go live in some sort of corporate fantasy land 24-7. I find that notion to uh, really speak volumes about the current we state are, the people? Of, of, yeah. Yeah, of this nation. I'll open it up to the field. Just to throw this in there. So the first community, this is from USA Today, the first community, which will be known as Cotino, C-O-T-I-N-O, and it will include close to 2,000 housing units, will be in Palm Springs, city of Rancho Mirage in California. All right. What do we think, folks? Good idea? Bad I mean, idea. It, it, it has to be done, I don't know what the word is, tastefully. It has to be done right. Sure, there's going to be tons of interest in it. Uh, people are Disney obsessed. But but yeah, it, I'm, I'm leaning more toward what Blake is saying. It, it kind of freaks me out a little bit. I will say I did a, a bit of research. And apparently, it's not the first time the company has been involved in any sort of real estate. There apparently are timeshare condos that can be bought like in Disney Vacation Club. And I think this is all in Florida. And, and this mm. is for like almost 30 years now. So not quite sure how that has worked. But it's not the first time that we've seen Disney dabble in, in real estate. Well, I was just going to say, this could be a branding nightmare if any crimes committed in one of these like Disney communities. Mm. Someone's going to, you know, hold up Mickey Mouse when he's coming out of the ATM. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of complications when you get into sort of curating a community, right? Like mm -hmm. a lot of liabilities, a lot of guidelines, mm -hmm. a, a lot of things that you don't have to worry about in the businesses. Well, then again, I mean, the cruise ships and theme parks, I'm sure they have tons of liability and issues that we just don't talk about because that's not really what we talk yeah. about here. But I don't know. Oscar, were you saying that they people can already currently live with inside Disney. Yeah. Land. Like you can live in like the hotels. I get that. But can you, are there like residential homes like within the park that people can stay in for like a short period of time, a week or two, a month? Yeah. I think it's within the Florida Walt Disney world. There's like right. timeshare condos and stuff like that. So I'm not quite okay. sure on how the branding works there, but uh, okay. I, there's interest in it. I just, but yeah, that's so much, so much could go wrong with this. It feels the more we talk yeah. about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, people staying in the park on dedicated properties for short periods of time, I could see as a, a little boost. They do that in the UK. I think it's Legoland. I think it's Legoland that you can you can stay like on property for like a night and they've got certain like homes that you can live in. But yeah, this seems like it's I don't really see that much upside to this. It seems higher risk than reward. Yeah, like who's gonna you know, teach the schools, who's going to operate the hospitals. <laughs> like these are, what are the local, what's the local politics? Is Mickey Mouse going to be the mayor? Like what I just, when you bring the, all of the realities of around. everyday life into door door. like this community, it, that's, I think that's the difference between like, yeah. you know, going somewhere on vacation for like a week out of the year versus like, you know, creating a life and raising a family <laughs> in Disney world. <laughs> Does, something's not adding up. It seems like this is Airbnb's business idea and they want Disney to sponsor it because it makes so much more yeah. sense as week long stays or, you know, mm, two week stays yeah, yeah. short term. But then you get sick short of it. You're like, I got to get out of here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I like the idea. The Yeah. Sponsored or themed Airbnbs, perhaps. But this, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see if it takes off. Anyway, uh, good and popular opinion from Blake. Um, that's what we've got time for, for Uncommon Knowledge. It's time now for Dinner Party Data. This is the part of the show where we tell you the most interesting thing that we've learned this week. And we start with Blake because he won this week's Game of the Week. Blake, what have you been learning recently? 
Uh, I've been looking at this uh, very interesting data that was sent to me a few weeks ago, and it it talks about the cost of having a puppy versus a baby in every U.S. state. So I know that you know times are tough. The economy oh. is uh, is taking a turn. Inflation. Maybe some people who are thinking about having uh, having a child might want to uh, you know just consider adopting a dog instead. At least that's what this is this is sort of laying out here. So the cost of having a puppy in the most expensive states. So the top fifteen most expensive states for the first year of dog ownership are Connecticut, California, New York, D.C., Massachusetts. Well, that's sorry, that's the top five. I'm not going to go through the top fifteen. We'll be here all day. But okay, they they range. They're roughly in like it, it costs roughly eight thousand to nine thousand dollars for your first year of of dog what? ownership. Whoa. Um. And then they look at the top 15 most expensive states for a baby's first year. Massachusetts, it's actually the most expensive state in which to have a baby for their first year. And it costs roughly $33,000. So, you know, it's a little bit more expensive. But the, what it gets really interesting is when you look at the baby puppy ratio from state to state. So in a state like Massachusetts, it costs... Eight thousand eighty four hundred dollars a year to have uh, to take care of a dog for the first year, and thirty three thousand dollars for a baby. But in a state like Alabama, that margin is a little bit slimmer. You see, I don't know why I find this interesting. I find it fascinating. In Alabama, yeah, it it's there's only a, roughly a ten thousand dollar difference annually for taking care of a puppy versus a baby. It's, it costs almost seven thousand dollars a year to take mm. care of that puppy, but it only costs 16000 to have a baby. So if you're living in Massachusetts, maybe you, you go for that dog. But if you're living in Alabama, you could really go either way because it's not that much more expensive to, you know, to have a baby. Yeah. I don't know See, why, but that's just the way it is. People listening to this who are about to start a family appreciate this, Blake, because they're thinking to themselves, we got 50 grand. What, what can we afford here? Should we get three dogs? <laughs> Should we get you know one baby, two dogs? Right. When Is you look at the, the the baby the the baby dog analysis, uh, <laughs> things get very interesting. Like that's huh. a whole thesis take on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Nine thousand dollars for the is that including buying the dog or is it what is that shots food? It was I need a breakdown. Very good point. It's that's actually a, it's adoption what they're looking at here, but it's weird because they're talking about adopting a dog versus having a baby, not adopting a baby. Mm. Okay. Wow, that's a lot of money. Oof. All right, <sighs> babies and dogs, Tense. not not cheap. Um, let's uh, let's move on to Oscar. All right, I don't know how I'm gonna follow that one up, but uh, yeah. But yeah. let's uh, let's talk about the Gilded Age. Let's talk about the Gilded Age. I've been watching this show called The Gilded Age on HBO. I'm sure you guys have not heard of it. No. Uh, it, it isn't for everyone. I, I can admit that. None of my friends are interested in history, no one. So to be honest, there's no one else to talk to about this. I wanted to talk to you guys about it. That's why it's Oscar been, corners us in the podcast. Yes, we can't go anywhere. We have to listen. History and boring, not really. I, th I find it so fascinating. For anyone that's interested in New York City history, the Industrial Revolution, you know, monopolies and the expansion west with railroads and all that, it, this show is for you. It's been great so far, about five episodes in. But please, please watch. It's also, a, you know, a time of high concentration of wealth and shift of cultural norms and things like that. So I pulled some interesting facts on the Gilded Age because I didn't know too much about it. And I wanted to share it with you guys. Um, so a couple interesting facts here. Nearly all the eligible men were political partisans. So voter turnout was the highest it's ever been, probably will ever be. It exceeded over 90%. Remember, women were not allowed to vote at this uh, stage in history. But 90% of men voted at, uh, back in the Gilded Age. So this is about the 1880s, 1890s. A couple of other interesting things. From 1860 to 1890, there were over 500,000 patents that were issued. So till this day, over that three-decade period, it's the most documented in American history. Wow. Um, so lots of inventions that were created. So really interesting. Um, and how much was created at that point in terms of technology. In terms of GDP, when we think of GDP, farming's share of GDP in 1870, can anyone guess what the sort of share of GDP farming made up? 85%. 
<laughs> a little bit high, but 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 it's high. Thirty eight percent. So close. So I know, close. crazy. It dropped to twenty four percent in eighteen ninety. Now, so when we look at just the output of farms, it only contributes about 0.6 percent of GDP. So much, much lower. So wow. it speaks to yeah how rural things were now. So now, including suburbs and cities, uh, you know, the population about 80 percent of the population currently lives either in a suburb or a city. But by 1900, only about 40 percent of the population lived in cities. So really, really interesting. Last, last thing. This was from a Gilded Age documentary. I saw. I know, kind of dorky. Uh, just, it's just I've been so into this. When we think about one thing that hasn't changed too much. Back in 1897, the richest 4,000 families in the U.S., they represented about less than 1% of the population, had about as much wealth as every other family in the country. Now, and the latest data was from 2017, the top 1%, so the same 1% of the population, held about almost 40% of the nation's wealth. So it's gotten a little bit better but not much has changed in about 120 years. So wow. that's it. Watch the show. It's great. Very good. It's called The Gilded Age. Netflix? Gilded Age. Yeah, it's on uh, HBO Max. HBO Max. Yeah. All right. Very good. Very good. Very interesting. Uh, Peter. Tough acts to follow, guys. Um, <laughs> so you got it. bringing it back to Disney nice. for a second, and we're going to talk about Bruno, even though nobody... Who? Bruno, really? So we're going to talk about Bruno. And clearly, nobody here has any idea what I'm talking about because you must not have seen the movie Encanto, oh, the Disney mm-hmm. animated film. Oscar, mm-hmm. I definitely told you to watch it, actually. Yeah, you talked to it me came about out, this. I have not seen it. <laughs> it came out in November 2021. <laughs> and just a hit on all accounts. It's about sort of this magical family um, who lives in Colombia. And I, I won't spoil anymore. But they had a song called We Don't Talk About Bruno. And it just became an absolute massive success on all uh, charts across social media on youtube etc so we don't talk about bruno it topped the billboard hot 100 and it became the second number one song from a disney animated film after a whole new world from aladdin from march 1993 so we thought disney had sort of made all of the hit songs right like but this song it was also at the number one spot for four weeks marking the first ever song from a disney film irrespective of animation or live action to top the chart for so many weeks. So by a lot of indicators, this was Disney's biggest song ever. And surprise, surprise, it was written by Lin-Manuel Miranda, who did a lot of music for the movie. And just when you thought they made all the catchy songs, they went and they made the catchiest song ever. This was bigger than, what, Under the Sea by Sebastian the Crab? It's crazy. That's insane. Uh, I must have heard it, but I will go listen. Go check it out. Go check it out. (laughs) Very good. Um, all right, cool. I've got one really quickly for you. So where did Valentine's Day come from? Well, the Catholic Church recognizes at least three different saints named Valentine or Valentinus, all of whom were martyred. So one story goes, one legend contends that Valentine was a priest who served during the third century in Rome when Emperor Claudius II decided that single men made better soldiers than those with wives' families. He outlawed marriage for young men. Valentine defied Claudius, performing marriages in secret. Claudius II had him killed. Second story is that uh, St. Valentine Turney was a bishop who was the true namesake of the holiday. He too was beheaded by Claudius II. What's wrong with this Claudius person? He's killing everyone. Uh, The second story is that Valentine uh, was killed for attempting to help Christians escape harsh Roman prisons. After being imprisoned himself, he falls in love with a young girl who visited him during his confinement. He was also killed, but before his death, it is alleged that he wrote the young girl a letter signed from your Valentine, an expression we still use today. Why February? Well, three theories. One, some believe Valentine's Day is celebrated in the middle of February to commemorate the anniversary of Valentine's death or burial, which probably occurred around AD 270. Others claim the Christian church popped St. Valentine's feast in the middle of February in an effort to Christianize the pagan celebration of Lupercalia, uh, a fertility festival. Uh, Number three, third reason it could be in February is during the Middle Ages, it was commonly believed in France and England that February 14 was the beginning of birds mating season. The English poet Geoffrey Chaucer was the first to record St. Valentine's Day as a day of romantic celebration in his 1375 poem, Parliament of Falls. 
Anyway, we need like a movie on this. Is there some sort of movie on I know. the story of Valentine's Day? It's a good question. Yeah, all right, should have one, but I don't, I don't think I've ever seen it. Hmm. Yeah, it's a fascinating idea, I guess. I, I don't know that one exists. That's all we've got time for for today's episode. Thank you so much for everyone for hanging out. Thank you so much to my guests. Thank you to Oscar. Thanks for having me, Marcus. Thank you, Blake. Good to be here. This week's winner of the game of the week. Thank you, Peter. My pleasure. And thank you to Victoria. She edits the show. Thanks to everyone listening. To ask us questions, just say hi. You can email us at podcast at emarketer.com. We'll see you guys on Monday for the Behind the Numbers Daily, an eMarketer podcast made possible by Mountain. Happy weekends. <laughs>